Now, how does this sound? Oh, yeah, that's much better. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay, so everybody had access. So that's not an issue. Is that true? Is that okay? To okay. So what I'll do, just in case, is uh, I'll make it so that it's linkable from my webpage at, at the university. So if you Google search Matt Scott Waterloo, and then look in for the teaching page, it will be accessible from there. Okay, and the oh, and the password is uh, Monod, M O N O D, all lowercase. Okay, if you got the link from from Erica, the, that's all taken care of. It just goes right to the page. All right. So if you give me ten minutes after the lecture, by four thirty, they'll be accessible. Okay. Um, what else can I tell you? I think that's it. Yeah. So. Let me bring you back to what we were doing at the beginning or the end of la last lecture, and then maybe we, you know, let me know if anything's come up since then. So we ended looking at this review by Minode with these different phases of growth. So you come in in the morning, you put your bacteria in your growth medium, and you let them grow over the course of the day. You see that nothing happens for a while, then suddenly they start growing exponentially, and then that tapers off and they stop growing, and then they all start dying. All right? And this, for a long time, was the main focus of, of bacterial physiology, if you want to call it that, um, for, say, 50 years. And people noticed certain things. So it's, it's very much like the study of Brownian motion. So for, you know, for about 100 years, people made qualitative uh, insights here and there, but, but nobody had an overall picture until 1905, obviously. And so people noticed, for example, that cells here were smaller, didn't seem to grow as well. Cells here were smaller, didn't seem to be growing as well, whatever that might mean. Here they seem to be big and growing well, but there was nothing to tie everything together. Okay? And so that's the status in 1949. We still don't know anything that I talked about earlier, which is this circular chromosome, ribosomes, and all of that. So what we're going to talk about today, or for this lecture, is where that view came from. Right, we have it, you and I, but let's look at the experiments that led to it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so here, this N is any cell that will give a colony when I plate it out on that agar. So here it might not be growing, but if I put it onto the agar plate and I wait long enough, it will give rise to a colony. So the, the sort of the catch-all that people use is viable cells. So they may not be growing here, but they, they're viable. They could grow. Here, this is bona fide death. Their numbers are decreasing. And so you plate them out, they don't make any colonies. They're, they're, they are dying. Does that make sense, where this N is going down? So you might have a million cells here, and then you wait a half an hour, and you try to plate it out again, and you get 10 times less colonies coming up. And the the of the ah, perfect. So this looks like a, a lifetime, right? You're going from birth to maybe old age to death. Right? And that's how people were viewing it, as sort of an intrinsic property of the bacterium, this life cycle. But, but there's something magical that's going to happen in 1957. And we'll come to that in just a moment. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I know it's weird, but um, we're talking about the cycle. But um, I cannot understand the relationship between the extinction. Uh, okay, you say they die. But uh, uh, we are recycling it, and we are putting nutrients on, uh, on them, so they are not going to extinct. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so he's saying, well, what? I, well, I'm going to paraphrase. It's not exactly what he's saying, but I'm going to twist it a little bit. So what he's saying is, this is, I don't understand why they go extinct. Can't you just feed them more nutrients or, or dilute them? You can, right? And so the thing that, that was missing here was something that's called balanced growth. Okay, so you, and it's a very small shift, but it made it all the difference. It suddenly, it, it, people went from not understanding anything to having some framework within the understanding everything. Okay, and so what's missing from this picture, and it comes back to your question, is, uh, so what is missing from this uh, picture 
So I'll tell you what's not missing. What's not missing is that people are thinking of bacteria as just a test tube uh, representation of humans. And we do that all the time. Everything, everything comes first to us. Like, you know, for, I'm thinking, for example, of, of our views of the universe. The Earth is at the center. Why, why, why wouldn't it be? And then suddenly you break that and everything opens up. And so here, we're thinking of bacteria as a, not spatially localized, but still it develops the way human develops. You break that, suddenly everything opens up. And so what's missing from this is something that's called balanced growth. And balanced growth mathematically is not going to shake the world, but it's a conceptual shift that, as I say, opened up a decade-long uh, golden age for bacterial physiology. And so this is an idea uh, that Campbell came up with in 1957, and it's the it's a, what I'm going to call a standard reference, reference state. Sorry, so it's a, a steady state of growth. A reference state. Where all the constituents of the cell double at the same rate. So mathematically, you might think of this as steady state exponential growth. So what Campbell says is, focus your attention here. That's the most important spot. All of these are experimental artifacts. Exponential growth is the real key to what's going on here. And you can see, I mean, it's not obvious at this point, but focusing in on exponential growth imposes huge constraints on what can be going on inside the cells. And so we write it out as, the, as a simple differential equation. So we say dn dt is equal to some lambda n, where this is our exponential growth rate. And you might have seen this even in high school when we say, OK, how we solve it as an exponential and things like that. But there's something really deep going on here. If the cells are doubling once every hour, then what do you know about the DNA content? Well, it doubles every hour. The RNA content doubles every hour. The protein content doubles every hour, like clockwork. The whole thing, this whole sack of chemistry, arranges itself so that its contents double precisely every hour. I mean, there's some fiddle room, maybe 5% or something like that. But the point is, there's this huge amount of coordination that's going on to give us this very simple empirical relationship, which is exponential growth. And as I showed you at the end of last lecture, this is a very good description of how, bless you, these cells are growing in this, in this uh, um, period of their, of their phase. And so with this notion of balanced growth, Campbell took this bacterial growth phase, these inevitable lag, exponential, stationary, and he broke it apart. And he said, just look here and dilute. And you can keep these cells growing forever. They never grow old. They have no lifetime. They exist perpetually. And you can put them into this balanced state where you know that they are going to double once every hour. Everything inside of them is going to balance, uh, double once every hour. Okay? And as I said at the end of last lecture, this growth rate, once it's been achieved and once you've, you've attained this balanced state, is incredibly reproducible. So you give me the bacterium that you were using two weeks ago, I grow it in precisely the same media, you know, whatever the chemical recipe might be, I'm going to get exactly the same growth rate as you. Right? So this is a lot like in, in thermodynamics where we have 25 degrees centigrade, one atmosphere of pressure, and so on. Do your experiments there, and then we'll compare what we get. You need that. Otherwise, there's no, I mean, quantitative science can't be done without a standard reference state. And that, that became apparent in 1957. Okay, so coming back to your question, they're, they're immortal. If you feed them enough, they'll live forever. Not the individual, but the progeny. So they divide. So, so you lose this notion of individuality, but the, the bacterium and its DNA will last forever if you keep feeding it. It's, it's okay. All right. Uh, any questions? This is a huge perceptual shift, but for us, I mean, it just means you're looking at this line rather than these five lines or four lines. Right? Yeah. Uh, 
All right, I think I know. So the question is, what's the, what, how long can a bacterium live? Um, and this, these, okay, these are deep waters, and so I'm just going to scratch the surface. But if you think of these bacteria, they divide, and they divide, and they divide, and they divide. And so if we talk about, there's no real notion of aging of these bacteria. You can inherit maybe your, your mother's pole, and so you could think that as the generations go, you'll have some bacteria that have one new half and then one old half. Is that sort of what we think? Um, but as far as we can tell, there's no change in its growth rate after hundreds of generations. So what we'll talk about toward the end of this week is some of the, uh, the new technological advan advances that have allowed people to ask and answer questions that were not available in the 1950s and 1960s. One of these is the ability to uh, isolate a single cell, a single mother cell, and watch it for hundreds and hundreds of generations and, and look at its growth rate and you see, you see no change. It's, it's incredible. So, so they really have no, there's no notion of age. They live forever, as far as we can tell. Any other questions? Is it they're really very different from humans, right? Uh, we don't want exponential growth. Our body fights like crazy to keep things from growing exponentially, except when we're developing. So embryonic development is a whole different issue. But then if you get exponential growth in your lifetime, it's a cancerous tumor, and it's terrible. I mean, it's, you just can't stop it. Uh, all right. So with this uh, standard reference state, this balanced growth, suddenly, as I say, a golden age opened up. So from 1958 to 1968, which is what we'll talk about today and the next couple of lectures, was really, uh, I, everything changed. So, so with this... Uh, standard reference state. <clears throat> we had a, uh, a golden age from 1958 to about 1968. All right. And so what I'll do is, is go chronologically through the discoveries of that period because I want to take you through the, 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 the first paper is, is remarkable and it's going to be, have sort of uh, repercussions that are not obvious. But the second one that we look at takes, takes a lot of quantitative thinking to get the, uh, the conclusions that they get. Okay? And so we'll come to that probably in about an hour or so. But let me start with the first paper from 1958. Okay, so this is... Uh, Schachter, uh, Mola, and uh, Kilgard, 1958. And you can see that it didn't take long uh, for people to, to exploit this idea. Um, so the main guy here, so Schachter and uh, Kilgard are postdocs in Mola's lab in Copenhagen. And Mola is one of the great, great scientists, but definitely one of the great um, bacterial physiologists. And he, so these are, uh, this is work done in Mola's lab. In uh, Copenhagen. Uh, and his philosophy was, look but don't touch. So when you do experiments, and this was, this was uh, he took it very seriously. So if you're going to study the growth of bacteria, he designed all of his experiments in such a way that there was a minimum perturbation to the, to the bacterium itself, which, you know, in principle sounds easy to do, but it's incredibly difficult <laughs> to try and keep these guys growing happily, take measurements, and not disturb them, all right? Particularly if they're growing very quickly. So his... Uh, his motto, if you like, or his, was uh, look, but don't touch. And so he, he perturbed these systems minimally, which meant that he, for the first time in his lab, had data of unprecedented quality. <laughs> I mean, nobody else was doing experiments like they were doing experiments. And that meant, in turn, that they could quantitatively think about these, these systems like no one had done before. 
Okay, and so what I want to talk about is this first paper from 1958. It's the first of a two-part series published back to back. The first one is steady state. So these, these cells are in balanced exponential growth. And all they do is look at the chemistry. They say, how much DNA per cell is there? How much mass per cell is there? How much RNA per cell is there? Okay, and so the first, this is the first of, of two... Uh, fundamental papers uh, published back to back. And I'm going to, when we talk about them, I'm going to talk about the first one, then I'm going to stick in a paper from 1960 and then talk about the second. Okay, because this one, the first one is uh, steady state or balanced growth. And the second one is about growth transitions. All right, so we'll talk about the steady state first. Okay, and then, and then we'll talk about another paper and then we'll go to transitions. And transitions are where you let them gain or, or adapt to balanced exponential growth and then you shift them to a different growth medium. And you have to do that shifting so as to minimally perturb the cells. That was a challenge. All right, so let me tell you about this first paper. So this is before E. coli had been uh, fully... St pardon me. Uh, ...had been decided upon as a model organism, and so they're working with salmonella which is very closely related to E. coli. And so if we repeat these experiments in E. coli, we'll get essentially the same thing. Um, but that's a small caveat. Okay, the idea was th uh, they had 20 different growth media. <laughs> and so they'd have so, you know, this, this sugar and this nitrogen source and mixing and matching all kinds of different things. And then they grew uh, salmonella in balanced growth. So they grow in uh, balanced growth. And I tell you how, how seriously they take this. They, they put the cells into balanced exponential growth for at least 10 generations before they take any measurements. So these are in, in bona fide steady state. There are no transients left. And then they measure the growth rate, and they measure the growth rate by plating these out and counting cells, and they do that 10 times per doubling to make sure that they've got enough statistics to reliably tell you what the growth rate is. It's insane, particularly because some of these cells are doubling about once every 20 minutes. And so every two minutes, they're plating out these cells and counting them. And so what they count, so they'll, they look at uh, uh, mass per cell, Uh, RNA per cell, uh, DNA per cell, at these different growth rates. All right, and so what I want you to imagine is two, two different growth media. Uh, I'll denote them by symbols. So let's use a triangle and a square. So these are meant to be flasks. If it was a better drawer, these, these are two beakers in your, in your laboratory. And this one has some poor carbon source, but a rich nitrogen source, for example. So this is poor carbon, rich nitrogen. And this guy's vice versa. So this guy's uh, rich nitrogen, or rich carbon, say. And poor nitrogen. And by that, I mean it takes a lot of, of different proteins to, to chew up this carbon source, but not much work to, to metabolize this nitrogen source, and vice versa. And so if you want something specific, this would be, say, ammonium, the ion, and this would be, say, succinate or something. This guy would be glucose, and this would be some amino acid that the cell has to break down before it can peel the nitrogen group off. Okay, But you engineer it in such a way that in either flask, the cells double once every hour. 
uh, once per hour. Okay, does that make sense? So chemically, the flasks are very different. Microscopically, the bacteria are, are turning on and turning off vastly different repertoires of proteins to chew up and metabolize their nutrients. But after all of that, they still double once every hour. Does that make sense? That's a scenario? Okay, so microscopically, these are very different. But macroscopically, they're identical. So these cells grown in uh, these two media are indistinguishable. They have the same mass per cell, they have the same RNA per cell, they have the same DNA per cell. By any macroscopic measurement, you can't tell them apart underneath the microscope. All right? any, by any chemical uh, measurement either. I mean, they're indistinguishable. And to show you how remarkable that is, it's, what it's saying is that the growth rate is in some sense a hydrodynamic variable, some state variable, that when you twist it, you get, you, you sample this whole state space, but the microstate might be very, very different. So something like energy and thermodynamics. Okay, but more than that, you can look at, say, things that double twice per hour or things that take two hours to double and things like that. And you can look at the growth rate dependence of these quantities. And what you'll get is something, or what you find, or what they found, is the following. So, uh, even more interesting, so there's more than this. If you uh, look at the DNA per cell, well, let's do mass per cell first. Mass per cell. And this is log, say, log 2 of the mass per cell. And this is now growth rate. And what I'm saying here is that triangle and square will have the same. So they have the same growth rate. And they have the same DNA per cell. I mean, if in an ideal world, they'd be right on top of each other. And they might well be. I'm just giving them a bit of scatter so you can distinguish them. But more than that is you arrange the growth rate, or maybe this should be the doubling rate, just so that we get the bases the same. So doubling rate. If you look at the slope, you, you get almost a linear relationship. And I'll show you the real data in a second. And in fact, this mass per cell Scales like two to the growth rate. So there's a lot in this figure. So let's, de let's, let's sort of pull it apart. So the way that I'm going along the horizontal is that I'm putting these cells in balanced growth. And then I'm looking at their number density as a function of time on a log linear plot. I take the slope of that. That gives me the growth rate. So each one of these dots is a day or two of experimentation counting cells as a function of time. And then there are 20 of these dots. So, you know, it takes a month or something to do this experiment. And at each point, you measure the growth rate. And then you also take a sample and you measure the number of cells that are in that sample and the dry mass of that sample. And then you take the reciprocal or the ratio, sorry, and as a function of growth rate, you get this exponential relationship. Does that make sense? I mean, not, not why it's 2 to the mu, but what I have plotted here, is that a sensible... Okay, so now if we look at the RNA per cell. Again, growth or doubling rate. Uh, it's steeper. So here's, here's triangle, here's square. This guy now is... about one and a half times mu. And it's more or less exponential. I'll show you the real data. And this one, now I'm looking at the DNA per cell. Drew that guy too close. And this 
this is again double rate. And it's shallower. And so it is proportional to say 0 0.8 times the doubling rate. Okay, so there are a few things that I want to draw your attention to. We won't really have uh, any rationalization for this for, for a little while. We need to look at two more papers first. But again, we have these very characteristic growth rate dependencies in this cell composition. So that now I can actually backtrack. So when we were talking about growth yield, it's almost impossible. You tell me it's succinate, I tell you what the growth yield is. But here, you tell me that the cell is growing two doublings per hour. I don't care what you're growing it in. I can tell you what the mass per cell is, average. The average RNA per cell and the average DNA per cell. And these are like ideal gas laws, if you like. Okay, and they came to be called growth laws. I'll show you the data here. Okay, so the real data is here. So mass per cell, RNA per cell, DNA per cell. You can see there's quite a bit of scatter. And an exponential fit is, you know, um, what would you call it? Optimistic, perhaps? Uh, the dashed lines, don't worry about those. Those are chemostats, and who knows what was going on. But the solid lines are what's important. These are batch growth, like we talked about last lecture. Growing them in a flask, stirring them up, counting things, chemistry basically. So the horizontal line is uh, biology, the vertical line is chemistry. All right, let me pause. Any questions? Yeah. Um, in the last lecture, you, um, you told about these methods, uh, which, uh, which is a way to counting the cell. Uh, so I don't understand how they count the RNA and DNA per cell. Uh, I mean, how, how, how is the measurement? Is it yeah. the same? Yeah, no, 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 it's exactly the same, thanks. So, so last time we were talking about how to count cells, where, where you plate them out, and then if they grow up, you can count them and then back calculate based on the dilution to the, to the number density that you had in your test tube. And so you would express it in, say, millions of cells per milliliter, for example, would be a way to measure that. So here what you would do to get the RNA or the DNA is you would take a sample again, and then you would measure how many micrograms of RNA were in that liquid, just chemistry. And so you would get micrograms of, or milligrams of RNA per milliliter, and then you take the ratio, and you get... I mean, in, 19, in 1958, mm -hmm. we, we knew about RNA or DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we knew, what the, we knew that there were molecules that are these long, long sugars, but we didn't know what they did. So that's a great point. So we know that the cell has this certain chemical makeup. The, the, there was a lot of work done by Germans at the beginning part of the 20th century working out the details of, for example, the, the Krebs acid cycle and things like this. So we know what the molecules are, but we just don't know how they work. We don't know what DNA... So remember, this is 1958. Okay, no, so by 1958, we know that DNA is a hereditary molecule, and we know that it, it, it carries some hereditary information. We even know that it's got a double helix structure. RNA, we don't really know what's going on at this point. We won't know for another two years, 1960. But we know that these are, we know chemically that these are there. Sorry, yeah, so we know their chemical identity, not their biological function. Mm, mostly for RNA. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so his other question is, how do you get the vertical axis? It's just chemistry. You measure, you measure the, you know, by various tests, the micrograms of RNA per milliliter, or micrograms of DNA per milliliter. All right, let me pause. Any questions? Yeah. Just a question on the data. Is the catalyst to Ah, yeah, yeah. Is there a reason Yeah, it's because it's uh, very difficult to find a growth medium that will, <laughs> that will fill this void. So that's partly why people liked chemostats in the early days, because you could... You could, in principle, sample continuously along a line, but um, they bring their own problems. So yeah, so, so you, it would then take a lot of ingenuity to try this, try that, to find precisely the right one. That's one of the challenges of batch growth. Any other questions? So as a physicist, you might be, uh, you might be worried about this. 
Do you see any problem? <laughs> Yes. Yes. This means that the, 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 the mass of the cell is getting uh, bigger, but the cell is not uh, doubled, or I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is, a, this is something unsettling to humans for reasons that I don't know. I also find it weird that what this is saying is that, on average, faster-growing cells are bigger. And I think that's counterintuitive, but I don't know why it is. I mean, I know why it's bigger, but I don't know why human, how, why we have a strange time with that. I have the same problem with daylight savings time. I don't know why it's so hard to figure out, but I, I have trouble every year. Uh, so the mass per cell, this is saying that fast-growing cells are bigger. And they are demonstrably larger. If you have a cell that's growing at, at say, one doubling per hour, and you have another cell that's growing, doubling every 20 minutes. There's about, you know, there's a fourfold difference in the. Did I do that right? Eightfold difference. There's an eightfold difference in the in the size of these two cells. Fourfold. Fourfold. <laughs> and so, if you mix these cells together and you look at them under the microscope, they look like two different species. One of them is tiny. The other one's this gigantic long rod. All right, that's very strange. Uh, it, it would be good if, if nothing else comes from this course. Remember that because it's almost inevitable that that you come across some biophysics literature where the resolution is that one guy was growing his cells slightly slower than the other guys, and that's why the sizes are so different. Well, it happens all the time. This is something that people seem to have forgotten. Okay, so that's 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 strange observation number one. Strange observation number two is. Uh, when we have a tendency as quantitative people, as, as physicists primarily, to check units. And the units here are bananas. There's, it doesn't make any sense. But if you're going to take uh, an input to a transcendental function, it best not have any units. Because right? it doesn't make sense. There's no dimensional consistency here. Does everybody see what I'm saying? Right, I'm, I've got two raised to the doublings per hour. It doesn't make sense. I mean, it fits the data, but there's something weird going on here. The uh, units are funny. So, I mean, the way the engineers would get rid of this is that they would put a, they would put a, a little fudge factor up there that has the same units. And they say, ah, there, we'll take care of it. And so the fudge factor here would be something that's one doubling per hour. But, uh, I mean, that's fine. It takes care of the dimensional consistency. But why in the world should one doubling per hour have any magical significance? Why should that be the characteristic time scale? I mean, one hour is a bizarre enough measurement for humans. Why would it have anything to do with E. coli? All right, so that's bizarre, that's bizarre number two. So the first one, well, why? I mean, okay, tell me why. Yeah, 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 it's true. I mean, it could be, what if it was 80 minutes? It would still be bizarre. But it's, I think, weird that it happens to be, I mean, it turns out that it's going to be a coincidence. But it's a strange coincidence that 60 minutes is the characteristic time that we also use as a characteristic time. Ours is totally arbitrary. This is also totally arbitrary, and yet they seem to be coincidentally arbitrary. I think that's weird. But you're right. I mean, if this was, happened to be 40 minutes, it would be no less bizarre. Right? You'd, at, you'd then again ask yourself, what's so special about 40 minutes? Right? So maybe that's how I should have phrased it. What's so special about, maybe the hour was, uh, was sort of a red herring. But asking, why, what, where is this characteristic scale coming from? Yes, 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 exactly. It gets rid of the problem with the units, but, but then that introduces a characteristic scale. And then you have to ask yourself, where does the characteristic scale come from? Is it, does that make sense? Right. I mean, you could equally have, 
have chosen uh, uh, you know, to make this guy unitless. And then you would say, OK, well, where does 40 minutes come from, or whatever. But the point is that there's a characteristic time, and we don't know where it comes from. But we will in maybe not today, but maybe an hour from now. OK, so these are two, um, these are two insights that are not immediately apparent from this plot. So there's a lot of magic going on. First of all, this is bizarre. I mean, to physicists, not so much, because you've seen this before, where you have degenerate states that give you the same macroscopic observables. So you, ha you can have you know, an, a huge ton of different microstates that give you the same pressure, for example. They all have the same energy, give you the same pressure. Not a big surprise. Here, for, for biologists, this is sh you know, was shocking. Probably continues to be shocking. I'm not sure <laughs> how well known it is anymore. Okay, that these, these cells inside, the regulation is very, very different, but macroscopically indistinguishable. Okay, this guy, uh, there's not too much to say now because we have, we have these two things out of the way. Certainly, fast-growing cells have more RNA, uh, and that the RNA content seems to be increasing faster than the mass content. So there's really only one one thing to notice here, and it's the opposite thing to notice here, is the RNA content <coughs> increases uh, more rapidly with growth rate. With uh, doubling rate. Then the mass. And here, conversely, the DNA tends to uh, or increases more slowly than the mass per cell. And so if you're going to take reciprocals, for example, if you had the RNA per mass, this would be slowly increasing with doubling rate. If you took the DNA per mass, you would have something slowly decreasing with mass or with doubling rate. And so DNA content you know, uh, less slowly or less rapidly. with a uh, doubling rate. OK. And so this was 1958. This set the stage. And this has been described as the fundamental, well, this and a follow-up paper as a fundamental experiments of bacterial physiology. This, this just blew the lid open. It's not obvious yet. Okay? But what did come out of this was that growth rate is an, an important uh, tuning parameter, an important macroscopical, macroscopic observable or state variable with which we can tune. And that presumably these guys are also important state variables in the description of our cell at this level. Okay, pause one more time. Any questions? Oh, I, I, I don't know about tumor cell, mammalian cells, but certainly for bacteria that grow, like E. coli grows, like Bacillus subtilis, these, they all exhibit this type of uh, growth law. That the bigger they are, the, the, or the faster they are, the bigger they are. Uh, I don't know about tumor cells. One of the tricky things about tumor cells is it's difficult to toggle their growth rate. Um, I mean, it can be done, but it's, people don't seem to do it. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't make sense. I will, though. I promise you. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm. I'm not ignoring the question. It's. Sh it's strange, right? Because, because what? What is this telling you? I mean, does it tell you that the the genome is somehow bigger, yeah. right? Because maybe the, the, the RNA kind of makes sense is because if you have uh, more doubling rate, it means that you have maybe more metabolism, so you need more protein to be uh, like uh, actually as build. build mm -hmm. more. Yeah, right? What, what? Or even they do basically proportional if the RNA just grow, right? I mean, just a kind of a copy. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Okay, so so this is, uh, I, I, I undersold this. This is really bizarre, as he points out. It, does this mean that the, these bigger cells somehow have more chromosomes than, than slower growing cells? And if it did, then as he says, does that mean they're a totally different species? What is that extra DNA? It's, all, it's at this point totally unknown. And the reason that I'm, I chose 1958 to 1968 is that there's no answer to that until 1968. And, and, and the answer is so elegant that it's worth <laughs> looking at <laughs> in some detail. Okay? But in 1958, or sorry, 1958, this is, this is a state. And so what I want to talk about now, what are we doing for time? 2.30. Yeah, we're good. So what I want to talk about now is this relationship, which comes from another paper in 1960 that was done, I mean, experimentally fairly s similar timing. It just took a little bit longer for them to publish. And then we'll come back to an experiment that helps to open up the, the question about why this might be happening, particularly why this one hour is, is meaningful, and what extra DNA could be, what the origin of that may be. All right, but let me pause. Does anybody have any other questions or um, what would you call it? Unsettled feelings? Great, great. All right, let's look at this guy. And again, remember this is all imbalanced growth. So these cells have been growing in the same test tube, the same flat, well, no, okay, not that same, the same growth medium for at least 10 generations before any of this data is taken. All right. Okay, so uh, it's worth taking a detour now. So we take a... Uh, Brief detour to um, 1960, 1960, and this is a paper by Neidhart and Megasanic, 1960. And so they use an altogether different bacterium <laughs> called. Uh, Aerobacter aeruginosus, but it's very similar to, to uh, E. coli, very similar to Salmonella, grows in your gut. Um, and so you can see there's a problem here, not just of standard reference conditions, but standard species. So after this, then E. coli became the standard. But if you repeat this experiment, and I'll show you data from E. coli of this experiment, uh, probably Wednesday or Thursday, you'll get exactly the same result that they get. And so they're faced with this problem that, we, well, we know what mass is, sure. We know what DNA is. It's a hereditary uh, information of the organism. But we don't know what RNA is. We don't know what it does. It seems like it's, uh, it's somehow related with protein synthesis. I mean, you and I know what it does, but they don't in 1960. It's, it seems to be related to protein synthesis, but in some obscure way. And so there are many theories out there. Uh, one of the observations is that uh, growing cells have more RNA per cell than non-growing cells. But then already you start to say, well, what do you mean by growing and non-growing? It's not a well-defined situation. And that's precisely their point as well. Uh, the other point is that it seems like as you measure the amount of protein, you also get a, co and you see a rise in protein synthesis rate, you see a rise in RNA synthesis or RNA content. But the relationship's not clear. And as I say, one of the theories is that RNA is used to make proteins in a stoichiometric way. So every protein has its own piece of DNA, which is then bound up with the protein. And that's the active molecule. There's a competing theory that maybe these RNA are templates for protein synthesis. But there's no way to distinguish between these two theories at this point in time. All right. So then Neidhart and Magasanic come on the scene. Megasonic is in, uh, at MIT, and he's a physicist by training, biochemist by, uh, by vocation, if you like. And Neidhart is, a, is one of the great bacterial physiologists. He just recently passed away. Um, and so together, they were, and Neidhart at this point is a postdoc. So instead of, of doing what um, Schachter did, they are looking at only the, the uh, ratio of RNA to protein. So they look at at the uh, ratio 
RNA to protein in a whole bunch of different growth conditions. So again, balanced growth. And then what they do is, so they did, you know, 10 generations in balanced growth. And then they take a sample, measure chemically the amount of protein per volume and the amount of RNA per volume. And then they take the, the ratio of that. And what they see is the following. So this is now, let me switch to exponential units or exponential base because I want to do some mathematics here. And here I've got the RNA to protein ratio. And what they see is if the growth rate's high enough, that ratio is linear. But as you start to go to low growth rates, it sort of saturates out. Okay, and so I'm trying to remember now if I put that data right after this. I probably didn't. Oh, I did. God, good. I was think, good thinking. All right. And so you'll notice a difference between their plot and my plot is that they've, they've, t they've flipped it. Um, and I'm not sure why, but <laughs> if, you, if you put it this way, so if you just flip it along the XY line, you got growth rate going here, RNA to protein ratio, and after about 0.6 in, in specific growth rate, it starts to go linear. And they've got a pretty restricted amount of data here, but this will go all the way to, to, to three doublings per hour, for example. Okay? Is that, that sensible? I mean, it, not why this happens, but is the data, is it clear what they're plotting? All right, I'm going to give you one more piece of information, and then I'll tell you their conclusion. So uh, also, this is, this is total RNA. So this is all of this chemical in the cell. But they found that 85% of the uh, total RNA is ribosomal RNA. They didn't know what ribosomes were for another 10 years, but they, they noticed that some of the RNA, when you extracted it from the cell, always, always came with a bunch of proteins strapped onto it. So there was RNA that came out, and then there was these RNA protein bundles that they called ribosomes. Okay, and 85% of the total RNA was in these bundles, irrespective of growth rate. And their conclusion was that these ribosomes synthesize or catalyze the synthesis of protein. And they say that just as a sentence. There is not a single equation in the whole paper. And it's meant to be, you say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, that makes complete sense. I, I think to, I, I don't know why, I, people must have been, you know, sensitive to this in those days. But I, I can't figure out how they would have expected the reader to understand that argument. So we'll go through the mathematics, but their argument is that this linearity coupled with this observation tells you that ribosomes must be playing a catalytic role in protein synthesis. That is to say that the rate of protein synthesis is linearly proportional, directly linearly proportional to the amount of RNA in the cell. Okay, and if that gives you a headache, let's go through it in a little bit more detail, but that's their argument. Okay, so this is the data. Let me pause, though. Any questions about the data? Yeah. Here? here? Yeah, okay, so we'll focus on here. Here, the deviation will come to on probably Thursday, Thursday or Friday, and it comes from the, uh, the, so the way these ribosomes work is they bring in amino acids, and so that, that uh, process becomes limiting at slow growth. And so your translation rate, the rate at which these ribosomes make protein, slows down. The rate per ribosome slows down. That's not obvious, but that, we'll come to that. Any other questions? So we'll focus on this part here. What Neidhart and Megasenic called moderate to fast growth rate. Oh, I should say also that 
they said th this observation that non-growing cells and growing cells have growing cells have more RNA than non-growing cells. They said is goofy. There's a continuum of, of RNA abundance. It depends on their growth rate. And so it's not that they have more, it's that they have linearly more. Is that understandable? All right, so let's look at the origin of this. So from this, they conclude Ribosomes catalyze protein synthesis. So at this point in time, 1960, there's no way to visualize that. I mean, this is a deep level of inference from fairly uh, high level data. All right, and so. Let's uh, look at the mathematics. So, so they've immediately argued against this idea that RNA is consumed in the reaction. Okay, so this is sort of going to be the first mathematical derivation of the course, but it's 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 so pretty. It's it really ties together a lot of ideas. One is this notion of balanced exponential growth, and then one is this this way that we infer mechanism from, from high-level uh, information like this. Okay, let's take a look. So everything is in balanced growth. So we're in balanced exponential growth. And so that means that, you know, the cell numbers... increase exponentially, that's no surprise. But everything inside the cell also increases at the same rate, this exponential rate. And so, as does every other, other uh, component of the cell. Right, the DNA, if you did DNA the rate of uh, increase of DNA would be linearly proportional to the content of DNA, and that proportionality would be the exponential growth rate for everything. Balanced growth imposes huge constraints. And so in particular, the uh, protein mass uh, let me call it M sub P increases like this. Okay, no surprise here. I mean, I'm deliberately sort of going slowly. Okay, again, it's exponential growth, which mathematically is so simple, but biologically so deep, that everything is increasing clockwork at the same rate. All right, now here's the insight. Where does that protein mass accumulation come from? And the, and the proposal by Ma Neidhart and Magasanic is that this is proportional to the action of these ribosomes. And so this is some, this is some uh, translation rate. Per ribosome. And then this is the number of ribosomes. Okay, and so by translation rate, I mean these ribosomes are putting together, say, 20 amino acids per second per ribosome. And that's where this mass accumulation is coming from. All right, so that's their... I oh, know, I've run out of room. All right, I'll erase this. Okay, so does that proposal make sense? So you've got the rate of, of protein increase, cut this guy out, is proportional to some rate per ribosome of synthesis times the number of ribosomes in the cell. 
That would be the, the hypothesis if ribosomes were playing a catalytic role. Okay. And so then now they, they say, well, I know that the ribosomal RNA is a constant fraction of the total RNA. Now, if I assume that the ribosomal RNA content of each ribosome is fixed, which makes sense, I think. So if each uh, ribosome has fixed amount, fixed R ribosomal RNA content, maybe it's worth just erasing this. And the total RNA is, uh, you know, proportional to the ribosomal RNA. Then you can replace that number of ribosomes by mass of total RNA. Then, what do you have? You have the number of ribosomes is going to be proportional to the mass of ribosomal RNA which will be proportional to the mass of total RNA. Does that string of proportionalities make sense? And you can figure them out from the biochemistry. Sensible? Then that relationship becomes this. Then you would have this DMP DT is equal to lambda MP, and then I'm going to use some new proportionality constant because I don't know what, what each of these proportionality constants is, but proportional to the content of mRNA. That is to say they're using RNA as a proxy or a readout of the ribosomal content of these cells. And they're allowed to do that because they know that this string of proportionalities is fixed across growth rates. It's always true. Now watch. This is just a, extraordinary. All right? It's in steady state. So just keep this part. And what do you end up with? You end up with this M or mass of RNA per mass of protein is going to be equal to growth rate times some K hat which is a straight line. I mean, theirs doesn't go through the origin. We'll talk about that in a couple of uh, lectures. But the interpretation here then would be that the slope of this line is telling you the rate per ribosome of protein synthesis. It's extraordinary. <laughs> so you get two things. You get this, this uh, hypothesis, if you like, that ribosomes catalyze protein synthesis, which we now know is true. And in fact, in the years that followed, people reconstituted protein synthesis in a test tube using ribosomes. So they fed ribosomes amino acids and energy, and they got protein out. And so that was a direct proof of this hypothesis by Neidhart and Megasanic, which comes down to this algebraic equation. It's very nice. Second of all, you get this insight that if you just measure the slope of that line, provided you know these proportionality constants, you can estimate how fast ribosomes make proteins. And it turns out that it's about 22 amino acids per second. Incredibly fast. These are very efficient catalysts. <laughs> All right, let me pause. That's the first math of this. Uh, is it? Yeah, this is, this, for all intents and purposes, the first math of this um, of course. We can take it slow, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And meanwhile, we have another expression for the growth rate, given by the matter in the Yeah. So, uh, how can one distinguish which one of the relations might be used? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so. Is this related to the biological involved in this? No, it's, it's a question of the, the regime that you're looking at. So, here was that Michaelis Menten. that we talked about, Monod's relationship, all of these experiments have the, the S is much, much bigger than the KD. 
so this guy disappears and you're, you're operating at the maximum, the saturated. It's only Minode who pushes down to these slow growth rates. Everybody else wants to keep these cells growing as fast as possible in that medium without their growth rate changing. So if the concentration is too low, then they start to change the concentration as they grow, and you start to change the growth rate, and you don't want that. So you put all the uh, nutrients to high excess so that, they, so that you're always in a saturated regime of these kinetics. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, well, you would, suppose you used this one, and you put it here. Is that okay? So you've got lambda max to all of this. But then you knew that in your test tube, this S didn't change. Then it would just be some constant. That's fine. You just absorb it into the, to the problem. You'd be okay. You wouldn't know what the, you wouldn't know precisely what the translation rate was, because you would have this, confounding constant in front. Does that make sense? But if you manage to push this as high as possible, so you would just add more and more and more and more, run the experiment again and again and again until you saw that the growth rate didn't change, then you would know that this constant was exactly the, or you would hypothesize that it's the catalytic rate of each ribosome. So it depends on how you manage your regimes, but you can always experimentally decide whether you're in that regime or not. Does that make sense? So it's like if you're doing numerical methods, you just double the grid size and see if anything changes, or you have the grid size. Any other questions? So again, this, is, uh, this pre predates any direct verification of this uh, hypothesis, but it gave people the, the momentum the, the, that they needed to, to start doing these types of experiments. And it wasn't long before they, as I say, reconstituted protein synthesis in a test tube. All right, um, yeah, let's have a break, but one thing that I want to mention here, no, you know, we'll do it after the break. Yeah, why don't we take a five minute break or however long it takes. Or go back in. Uh, so, so with this, uh, this relationship in 1960, there, there are three points that I want to make that are beyond this. The first is that this, this is true, I mean empirically true, that you get this near linear relationship at fast enough growth rates that suggests that you have this coupling between growth rate and, um, and ribosome abundance. But then immediately, scientifically, you ask yourself, where does that come from? How do you ensure that that happens? And so as soon as, as this, published, this work was published in 1960, it inspired generations, at least two generations of, of uh, biologists to search for regulatory mechanisms that would make this happen. And so, so some of the outgrowth consequences here are, uh, one, how do you regulate, I mean, this is, this is a, a correlation, but how do you cause it to happen? How do you regulate the uh, growth dependence in uh, this ribosomal content. And many people have worked on this, so I'll just give you a short list. Nomura is a big player. Hans Bremer. Rick Gors. Many others, and the answer is that it's still controversial. These guys all argue with one another. Well, Nomura is a, doesn't argue as much. <laughs> these guys, these guys uh, will argue with one another about what the mechanisms are that ensure this growth dependence. So it's still controversial. And this is, so now, 50 years ago. Two, how do you ensure that this is true? Did you maintain the stoichiometry between the ribosomal RNA and the ribosome content? You know, because what you find is that there is very little free ribosomal RNA floating around. There's almost no ribosomal protein floating around. Okay, so how do you ensure, do you keep uh, the 
RNA content uh, of the ribosome and a fraction of total RNA a constant across growth rates. And this was unequivocally answered by Nomura. And I'll say a couple words about that because it's so elegant. So what I'm asking is, if we know that the total RNA is 85% is ribosomal RNA, and we know that there's some certain stoichiometry in the ribosome, so for example, for E. coli, the E. coli ribosome is 2 grams of ribosomal RNA to 1 gram of ribosomal protein. So it's two-thirds of the mass is ribosomal RNA, and one-third of the mass is ribosomal protein. So you can think of these ribosomal proteins as little tiny structural proteins that are holding together giant tangles of ribosomal RNA. But you never find ribosomal RNA free, and you never find ribosomal protein free. Somehow, and there are 53 ribosomal proteins, 54. How do you make sure that these guys all come together all the time in concert? Does everybody see the problem? So the genius of Nomura, and this is an aside, I mean, it's not really part of what we're focusing on here because this took 20 years to figure out. But what Nomura found was that ribosomal proteins are obviously very good at binding to RNA. And so what they do is they bind to the mRNA, the message RNA that makes those proteins and shuts them off. So if there's any free protein floating around, it pins down to its own message RNA and stops protein production of ribosomal proteins. It's very clever. <laughs> so this was answered by Minura, M Nomura. This is still not unequivocally answered. But then the third point that I want to make is that, and this is something that we appreciate now in hindsight, is that if you want to make more ribosomes, you need to make more ribosomal protein. And if you make more ribosomal protein, you need to make less of something else. And so although you do get this linear increase in the ribosomal content with growth rate, that comes at the expense of making linearly decreasing levels of some other protein. All right? And so that's the last point I want to make, and we'll come back to that on Thursday probably. So the third point that is, is um, to make uh, more ribosomes at ribo in rapid growth, we necessarily make less of some other protein. Okay, and I'll talk about that constraint in much more detail after we've talked about these historical papers. Just historically, this is, this is at least three consequences to come out of this very uh, elegant but small study by Neidhart and Magasonic in 1960. Yeah? Can I ask a side question? Sure, yeah, um, when were they able to see the, the things in a cell? I mean, the microscopy. To visualize them? Yeah. So, so the question is, when were they actually able to visualize this process of ribosomal um, translation? There, there were uh, electron micros micrography, so they could do electron micro. So they couldn't observe it in real time, but they could freeze cells, cut them open, and then look at, they would see it's sort of a squiggle molecule and then a bunch of little black molecules that were the ribosomes. So and they, it looks sort of like a Christmas tree. It's a really spectacular picture. But that's not, I mean, it's not quite the dynamic picture that's here. That, yeah, would probably take till the 1980s, mid-1970s. We'll talk about that probably in, in a few lectures. It's okay? Friday probably. Any other questions? All right, let's look at the last, uh, last paper of 1958. Oh, I didn't pass around the sheet. I'm going to pass around the sheet now if you don't. I'm going to give you guys this. All right. So now 
we go to the second paper of uh, 1958. So this one is uh, same three as the first one. But now Kilgard gets first billing. And this is uh, growth transitions. So, so far we've been talking about steady state balanced uh, exponential growth. Now in this paper, what they're going to look at is something that's growing in a slow, uh, growing slowly in a particular growth medium. And then they add uh, two times concentrated uh, fast growth medium. And then the cells sort of take off. And, and the question is, what happens to all those things that I showed you uh, after a transition? So they look at two different types of transitions. So they look at a shift up, which is one that I just described, and a shift down. But the uh, shift down is much less clear what's going on. And that, that's partly because you need to make new proteins to be able to consume these, these uh, poor growth media, poor nutrients. So we'll look at this. All right. And so let me uh, sketch what they see. Bless you. Um, it's probably best to do it with big... on a big uh, scale. And so this has been described by uh, Suk Chun Jun at UCSD as a, as a prism. So the growth transition takes place here at zero. They, they change the growth medium or they add a, a richer growth medium and the cells start growing at a different rate. And all of these constituents then split up. So the RNA per cell, the DNA per cell, the uh, number, the cell numbers, these all change to their new rate, their new exponential balanced growth at different times after this shift. Okay, and I'll draw it in an idealized way so that you can see what's going on here. So this is log two of whatever. You can think of it as X per milliliters if you like. And you've got something that's growing at some particular rate. And like they've done, I'm going to separate these two lines, even though these two lines could be right on top of each other, just so that it's clear what goes on. This is t equals zero, which is the time of the shift. The, let's see, the RNA per cell transitions discontinuously. As fast as you can measure it, it's already at, its, uh, at or above its new uh, rate of growth. And so this was the first growth rate, mu1. And this is the second growth rate, mu2. And mu2 is much, much bigger than mu1. In their case, it's about double. So it's not hugely different. How do you get the yeah. transition? Yeah. So say you've got medium A that it grows slowly in, and you've got medium B that it grows fast in. They made this twice as concentrated and then just dumped it in. And then it is basically medium B immediately. Does that make sense? All right, and so this is the rate of growth of the RNA. Then you transition, bonk, the RNA goes up like this. You wait about uh, five minutes, and then the mass per cell starts increasing. So this space here is, uh, how will I do this? This thing here is T mass is about five minutes. And then you keep waiting and you'll get uh, the DNA increasing here after about 20 minutes. So here, this is T DNA, it's about 20 minutes. So that's the top three uh, lines that they've got written here. They write optical density because they're using that as a proxy for mass, but mass is easier to imagine. And then a long time after, 70 minutes later, the 
uh, cell numbers it starts increasing. So this is meant to be uh, one continuous line. So this now is T cell is about 70 minutes. All right. So let me let me summarize and then let's go through it. So one, uh, the order matters. So you get T RNA, which is like essentially <laughs> minus five minutes if you want to keep this continuous, is less than T mass, which is less than T DNA, which is less than T cell. Does that make sense? T RNA is basically not, I mean, you can even not imagine. It's a discontinuous shift, so you can leave it out if you like. And then there's also the timing. So the timing is that T mass is about five minutes. T DNA is about uh, 20 minutes. And T cell is about 70 minutes. All right. And what they found was that it didn't matter what you started with and what you finished with. Those times were always the same. times irrespective of where you started mu1 and where you finished mu2. All right, and then uh, the other point that I want to make, oh yeah, is that these shifts are basically uh, piecewise linear. on a log scale, which means they're piecewise exponential. OK. Those are three observations that you can make from the, the graph. The, the inset here is the DNA content per cell. And so as was mentioned before, these guys go from having what looks to be about one and a half chromosomes to having three chromosomes per cell, whatever that might mean. OK, we'll come back to that, obviously. OK, so these three observations are the ones that I want to draw your attention to. Does anybody have any questions about what I've written here? Hopefully, can you see from the data that my idealization is not too far off? I mean, their lines are better drawn than mine, obviously. <laughs> but the, the data is not far off from the, the cartoon figures or the line fits that I have written or they have written. OK, now a really. So I think on the face of it, this looks puzzling. Why should these times all be the same? Or, yeah, I mean, they're not the same among each other, but I mean, why should T cell always be 70 minutes afterward? Why should it have nothing to do with these growth rates? That's bizarre. Okay, that's bizarre observation number one. Um, bizarre observation number two, I can't remember now. <laughs> anyway. I'll think of it again. So that's strange. Why should this timing always be the same? And what Mola noticed, and what we'll go through for the next 10 minutes, is that actually you could have predicted this from the steady state data. And that is not at all clear. Okay? Or better said, from the shift data, you could have inferred what happened in the steady state. All right. Let me pause, though. Again, is the data clear? Okay. And so Mola's claim, and this just is an example of how quantitative Mola was. Mola's claim, these timings, these times uh, are implicit in the steady state data. So those growth laws that I showed you at the uh, beginning of the lecture, where they had the steady state, mass per cell, and so on, all of those relationships are buried in these timings, as I'll show you in a second. Yeah? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so, 
Yeah. No, these guys are per volume. These are per volume, yeah. And then you would take the ratio as per cell to get the... We'll do that, though. We'll take the ratio in a second. So this is log base N per volume per, you know, milliliter, say. So this is bona fide chemical content of your test tube. I remember what I was going to say. This separation of time scales to MOLA suggested that these are all independently regulated events. Whatever's regulating cell number, i.e. cell division, is an independent regulatory process from what's the dictating DNA, for example. So his argument was if they were the same regulatory process, they'd be, they'd be kinking at the same time. See if you agree with them. It doesn't... <laughs> he suggests that this decoupling is a decoupling of regulation as well. All right, let's see why Mola says this. Okay, so I'll bring you back to, um, say, mass per cell. And this is doubling rate. And what we had was that this is something like 2 to the mu. And now Mola's observation is that you go from growth rate 1 to growth rate 2, you slide along that line. Who cares about the transients? <laughs> you go from here, at, and then at T0, you shift up to here. Okay, it might take some time to get there, but the slope of this line is exactly the amount of time it takes you to change. And again, that's not obvious, and we'll go through it in some detail. Okay? And so what he's saying is that because you have this exponential or this linear relationship on a log scale, you would expect that these times are all going to be, well, relatively the same. It, the easiest hypothesis is that they'll stay the same. So let me show you how he gets that. All right, let's take a look. If I can erase that, that's all right. All right. And so let's, uh, let's go through this in some detail. So if we're looking at, for example, the mass per cell, I'm going to call that uh, M2 of T. So that is in, uh, or this is the mass per cell at growth rate or doubling rate mu2. Then this is going to be the ratio, as you said, of the mass to the number of cells. It's going to be the mass to the number of cells at, you know, again, growth rate 2. Right? Does that make sense? And so what we're going to exploit is that these things are increasing exponentially and that they are piecewise exponential, that their, their shift is so abrupt that they're basically uh, linearly, what would you call it, piecewise linear on a log scale. Okay, it's going to take a little bit of fiddling, but it, it's not terrible. All right. And so in the, uh, in the rich medium, that's a long post, post shift, you'd have this M2 of T is equal to some you know, M2 of T, which I have written here, but I'll write it out in a s more detail, with M2 given by this 2 to the M2, or mu2, T minus T mass. I don't think that's visible. Two to the mu two T minus T mass. Okay, that's this line right here. 
So I know the slope is mu2. I know that it transitions at this time t mass. And then I also know that this initial point here is going to be m1 m1 at t mass. That is to say, it follows the first growth rate until it reaches this, this transition time about five minutes later. Okay, let me pause. So what's buried in there is that the shift is, is piecewise exponential, and I'll show you where that comes in in a second. And then the second part is that it grows exponentially at the new rate immediately after this shift. Does it make sense? Do all the symbols make sense? Okay, we can do the same thing down here. So the uh, n is going to be, n2 is going to be now n1 at t cell times 2 mu2 t minus t cell. So far, so good? All right. Now we'll, we'll, we'll mix it around. So um, here, these, these pre-shift rates, so these are pre-shift, are again in balanced exponential growth. They're growing with this doubling time of mu1. And so they look like this. Uh, mu1 at time 0, or m1, n0 times 2 to the m1 t, 2 times the m1 t. That is to say, these guys are both increasing exponentially at some given rate with some initial condition. Does that make sense? So now I can substitute that into those expressions over there. And it's going to be horrendous. I'm going to have a ratio of a bunch of exponentials multiplying one another. But they'll simplify in a very nice way, which I'll show you in a second. But I want to make sure both, both halves of this, con this uh, calculation are sensible. Are there any questions about it? So these are the post shifts. Everything's growing at mu2. These are the pre shifts. Everything's growing at mu1. Let's bring it all together. So then, all together. All right, this will take just five minutes. So then, all together. This uh, m two at time t is going to be this um, m one. 0 over n10, these initial conditions, times 2 mu1 t mass times 2 mu2 t minus t mass divided by 2 mu1 t cell times 2 mu2 t minus t cell. And let me take a step back. Okay, this is the piecewise exponential that dictates the mass, and this is a piecewise exponential that dictates the number. And I take the ratio. So far, so good. Now, this thing is going to tidy up very, well, very nicely because of this 2 mu 2 to the t, 2 mu 2 to the t. That is to say that post-shift, when it comes to equilibrium, their rates are the same as they should be because it's imbalanced growth. And so this will tidy up. So in balanced growth, first of all, this guy, mu2 of t, becomes a constant, or this m2, sorry, becomes a constant. Second of all, this uh, m1, or this, this ratio, m10 over n10, is a constant. That's what we mean by balanced growth. 
and those two exponents cancel so that, let me write it up and then let's talk about it. So that we get a constant equals m1 2 raised to the power t cell minus t mass times the difference of these growth rates, mu2 minus mu1. All right. Whew. Okay, it's very nice. Um, I mean, it's not it's super nice yet. We'll, we'll see that it's going to be very nice in a second. Okay, but so far so good. Is that calculation okay? It's the rules of exponents, basically, and this constraint that we have balanced growth. Much is. Now, if I take the logarithm of both sides, so I take log uh, m2 is going to be log m1 plus this now uh, t cell minus t mass mu2 minus mu1. Is that okay? These are base 2. I can tidy this up a little bit. I'll move this over to one side. And I'll call this delta log 2, delta log 2 of the mass, meaning the difference in the logarithm of these mass per cell at, at growth rate 2 and growth rate 1. And that's going to be equal to this difference T cell minus T mass. And I'll call this the delta growth rates, delta mu. All right, why do I do that? for the following reason. So let me write this last piece up, and then let's talk about it. And again, this is the last thing we'll do today, so bear with me for two minutes. Or this delta log base 2 of m, the mass per cell, divided by delta mu is equal to the difference in times, t cell minus t mass. All right, and then let's go back to the steady state. So this is mass per cell, log base 2. This is the doubling rate. What's this slope then? What's that? Exactly. Right? So this is telling you that the slope of this line, which we know to be one doubling per hour, is going to be this uh, difference in times. Okay? And so this slope here, we know, so we know that this thing is like that. And so out in front here, we have one hour per doubling, or divided by one hour per doubling. But the implication from the shift data is that the slope is going to be T cell minus T mass. Does that make sense? So that's all of this calculation. Again, Mola left this unstated. It was implied just by the words. Oh, we had one figure, but it's very obscure. How does it compare? Well, if we now look at these guys, we end up with the T cell is about 70 minutes minus 5 minutes. It's about 65 minutes. The slope up here is about 60 minutes. It's an error of about 10%. On the other hand, it's very hard to tell where the kink in this line is. Could be, you know, maybe 60, maybe 65. That's not a bad estimate. And it's a self-consistency check. Now, if you look at the DNA per cell, you do the same calculation, the DNA per cell it has a, uh, a slope of about 48 minutes, I think. It is uh, 48 minutes from the steady state. And it's about, well, 
we can calculate it, 70 minus 20, which is 50 minutes from the shift. So it's an extraordinary level of agreement. It's like within 5 to 10%. And again, it's a self-consistency check. And in retrospect now, it doesn't seem miraculous that the timings are always the same because you end up with this straight line relationship for all doubling rates, more or less. It's extraordinary, really. All right, and so then one question that we had was why are our cells bigger, faster growing cells bigger? It's because it takes 70 minutes before the numbers start to increase. Okay, that's not really an answer. It's just pushing the question to another question, which is why does it take 70 minutes for this guy to start up? And we'll answer that um, tomorrow or Wednesday. I, can't, I, I don't know when, when the timing will work. Okay, but let me pause. Does any, anybody have any questions? So here we have a brilliant piece of self-consistency between these two very different experiments. Steady state exponential growth and shift experiments. And we see they match up very nicely. And the question is, why? Right? Okay? All right. Okay. I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. <laughs>